Tonight's speaker is Dr. Frank Rawls. He's the director of the Adult Sleep Medicine Program at the University of New Mexico Medical School. He's also the director of our uh, program here at the Los Alamos Medical Center, uh, the sleep study lab up on the third floor of the hospital. Dr. Rolls uh, is also the director of the fellowship program at UNM. He went to school in um, University of Wisconsin, kind of not too far from University of Michigan where I went to school, and um, runs, uh, and he's going to tell us tonight what sleep apnea is, how it affects us, and how it's treated. So Dr. Rolls, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and we're going to try this video. If it doesn't work, it won't be the first time that something doesn't work in life, you know? I think that's okay. But thank you for your invitation, and let's just try this and see if they can capture the sound. Okay, how, how many of you are plagued by the sounds of snoring? A few of us, yes, absolutely. And so I want to talk about obstructive sleep apnea and what we can do about it. And I did have one special request to please try to put in a little something about uh, narcolepsy. So I really tried to fit it in, even though that's a whole hour lecture. I'm going to try to put it into three slides only because it was a request. So we want to understand some of the mechanisms behind sleep apnea. 
We want to see some risk factors that increase the incidence of sleep apnea. Understand the effects of sleep apnea on the cardiovascular system, which affects all of us, and then learn some basic treatments for sleep apnea. So you ever wonder what makes individuals snore to the point that a partner sleeps elsewhere? I have had two people within the past two years where their partner literally left them because they snored so loud. And they, they finally showed up and came into the sleep center. I thought that was pretty shallow, but you know, uh, they did come in. And why are people tired or sleepy and they've slept 10 hours? It's amazing. You see school children, they sleep 10, 12 hours, and they're incredibly sleepy during the day. Why do individuals require three or more medications to control their blood pressure? Why is it that their blood pressure is so elevated in the morning when it should be pretty low? What's causing impotence in a lot of middle-aged men? Believe it or not, sleep apnea. One of my uh, partners who I trained at the VA, she says the only thing that motivates the VA men to use their CPAP is she tells them your impotence is in part because of your sleep apnea. That's the only thing that motivates them. Why is diabetes so difficult to control in some individuals? So we want to take a look at these things and kind of learn from them and get motivated to use sleep, our CPAP. This is a normal night of sleep, or abnormal and normal. On this side is abnormal. What this graph represents, the lines keep going up because the person wakes up all night long. And this line down here is the oxygen that's moving up and down because all night long the oxygen's going from 92 to 80. Um, it might go, in our lab the record is 26%. Can you believe someone can li live at 26% oxygen? But that's our record. And we see people drop into the 50s and 60s uh, commonly because this is what sleep apnea does. The physiology of your brain changes when you fall asleep. And this is a normal sleep. And on this side, normally you get, this is awake. The second line is one, two, and this is stage three sleep. And what's released there is growth hormone. That's a normal hormone that's released. Children really need that growth hormone. And sometimes when kids have sleep apnea, mom and dad may each be six foot tall, but then their little one is just, you know, never gets above three feet. And there's a reason that for that, and that's uh, if they're waking up all night, they don't see stage three sleep, and they don't release growth hormone. The other thing that happens is testosterone levels begin to increase with the first cycle of REM. And so a lot of men become impotent because their testosterone they, uh, never increases, is never elevated during the night. And that's simply because this black piece, which indicates rapid eye movement sleep, if you have terrible sleep apnea, you never see rapid eye movement sleep. OK, so what is obstructive sleep apnea? It's a reduction in the upper airway muscle tone during sleep. Uh, the way to think about this is the Mueller reflex it's the feeling you get when you're swimming underwater and you want to take a breath in, but you can't breathe in because you know you'll, you'll breathe in water. And that sensation of trying to suck things in, that's the Mueller reflex. And that is what sleep apnea causes. And so what you see here is with the Mueller reflex, um, you burn up so much energy that within seconds, your oxygen level drops. And again, it can drop 3%, 4%, it can drop 20%, all because you're working so hard to breathe against a closed airway. And so what's reflected here, the bottom line is the oxygen of the individual. Uh, and so this person is having lots of sleep apnea here, and his oxygen is dropping from about 92 to 75. He keeps jumping up and down between 75 and 92. He drops all the way below 50% because all night long this person is obstructing. He's trying to breathe against the closed airway. He's eating up oxygen. And so he's in almost a perpetual state of hypoxemia. So this is a graph that shows basically this is the physiology. The airway obstructs. And this line is flat because no air is coming through. Your oxygen level. By the time it reaches your finger, it drops, in this individual, 87%. The brain finally wakes up. And this is what you hear for those of you that have partners with sleep apnea. Sometimes either you've elbowed them awake, you know, they got bruises on their chest, or they go, <gasps> that's what's happening. They're waking up because the brain says, you know, it's fine to drop into 90, but maybe tonight I don't want you living at 60% oxygen. It's not good. 
So here's a graph that shows that obstructive sleep apnea, the biggest uh, uh, item that's obstructing is the tongue, and when the tongue falls back, then you're no longer able to get air in here. And to have an obstructive apneic event, the obstruction has to last at least 10 seconds, and depending on, on which rules you're using, uh, you have to drop your oxygen saturation 3% minimum or 4% minimum by Medicare standards. Look at this individual. These are the three kinds uh, of breathing, normal, and so this is the air pressure coming through your nose, in and out, in and out. Here's your chest, up and down, pretty normal. With obstructive sleep apnea, you have the muscle in your, in your uh, neck basically prevent any air from coming through, and you get a flattening here. And so when you have a sleep study, they put this tubing around your nose that looks like oxygen, and it's measuring air coming in and out. And it also is another sensor that measures heat, so you can see what the air is coming in and out. And then there's a couple belts on your chest that see if your chest is rising or not. So with obstructive sleep apnea, the tongue is the big problem. With central sleep apnea, the brain is saying, stop breathing. And this happens with a lot of us as we get older. We're more prone to central sleep apnea, uh, congestive heart failure, heart disease. You're more prone to central sleep apnea. And there are other mechanisms driving this, primarily carbon dioxide. But these are the two main kinds of sleep apnea. Central, central's a little low down here, and obstructive. Probably the most common is obstructive, which is what we'll focus on. But if we measure all the times that you stop breathing and divide it over, uh, over the night, then you get what's called as an apnea hypopnea index, or meaning you have pauses in breathing, or you stop breathing, and you desaturate. That's the apnea hypopnea index. And so less than five is normal. We feel that if you stop breathing a, a, a few pauses at night, no big deal. But if you go above 30, then that's very severe. So five, uh, most people will write 14.9. I just rounded off to 15. Uh, five to 15 is mild. 15 to 30 is moderate, greater than 30 is severe. So that's how we're measuring sleep apnea. If you get a sleep study, you get this report, that's what that report means. Now look at this individual. We just studied him within the past month. Notice how flat the lines are here. This is 155 seconds that he does not breathe. 155 seconds. I think he has the record for the lab right now. He's breathing fine. This line is, all these things are flat. And look at his oxygen. He starts off at about 90% here, but the more he can't breathe, he drops into the 40s or lower. So when you have sleep apnea, you can live this way for years, but it does catch up to you. And so what does someone like this really look like? Here he is. He decides to at least have the decency to breathe a little bit. So he takes a few breaths. He goes flat. And this is like 60 seconds, takes a few breaths, obstructs for 10 or 15, a couple breaths, obstructs for 10 or 15, takes another 60 second break, and he lives that way for many, many years. These are guys that when I was practicing family practice in rural Wisconsin, they'd be intubated by now. But he's been living this way for many, many years. And look, at this is the hypnogram. He wakes up, that's why the lines go up, and here's his oxygen all over the place. And what does someone like this look like, you ask? The reason it's so quiet is he's not breathing. Try holding your breath this so long while watching it. He's trying to breathe. That's why you see his chest wall.
And what he does from there is he simply sits up and he falls back to sleep. Because every time he lays down, he goes through this, almost every hour, he goes through this event where he just cannot stay uh, awake, but he can't breathe. The, the brain doesn't like him stopping breathing 60 seconds, 155 seconds at a time, but he has been living this way for lots of years. So how common is this condition? If we tested the average population, we would find that roughly 20 to 25% of men have an AHI greater than five. So do we have to treat 25% of men? Not really, only if you have symptoms uh, do, you, do we treat people with an AHI greater than five. Now if it's above 15 in the moderate range, all those people should be treated. So if we look at people, uh, middle-aged men, 4% of all middle-aged men have uh, obstructive sleep apnea with excessive daytime sleepiness, and 2% of women. So women up until menopause uh, have half the amount of sleep apnea that men do. So why is this? Well, one thing is they, we see that what, before menopause, the progesterone is protective. It's a respiratory stimulant, and it helps women to breathe. But it, once you go through menopause, the degree of sleep apnea basically skyrockets and becomes the same as, as that of men. Um, and I was reading an excerpt that said one of the ways they found this out is they liquored up a bunch of cats. Researchers sometimes just have to find things to do. And so they gave them about an ounce per kilo, which may be, I don't know, 10 stiff drinks for any of us, and the cats, cats stopped meowing. Kind of like you and I, if you had too much to drink, you stop talking and down you go. And then they injected the cats with progesterone and they started meowing again. So apparently that's, I would say, one of the discoveries of progesterone working well. So what are the most common symptoms? We said excessive daytime sleepiness, incredibly common. Pauses in breathing, you just see these people stop breathing. Incredibly common. Snoring, very, very common. Poorly controlled hypertension, it can be very common with severe sleep apnea, and I'll explain why in a few moments. Sexual difficulties, we just mentioned that. You don't go into rapid eye movement sleep, your testosterone levels go down. Uh, in children, you see a lot of hyperactivity. Now this is a unique case because uh, he was in the lab, oh, within the past six months. And what this is here is that's his brain. And at first glance we say, was he having a seizure? But he's not having a seizure. The technician called me and said, I think the guy's having a seizure. But guess what? He's not having a seizure. He's moving his, his uh, can you hear me pretty good without the mic? Or do you need it for up there? Sorry. So the reason he's doing that is he keeps moving his head side to side because that's how much energy it's taking him while he's sleeping to get a breath in. So people have bizarre behaviors when they're sleeping. Sometimes it's the sleep apnea. So he's moving his head back and forth just to get his oxygen level back up. So what other symptoms are there? Well, it depends on the age group. With children, we do see pauses in breathing. We'll see secondary enuresis where they are potty trained, and all of a sudden at the age of six, they start wetting their beds again. We see a lot of hyperactivity, and that's because when children, when their brains are tired, they will self-stimulate. They'll find something to do, and it helps to keep them awake, whether it's throwing spitballs at the teacher or getting in trouble. Uh, they are, they are self-stimulating. And so about 9 to 13 percent of kids are excessively sleepy, but a lot more of them have hyperactivity. Uh, morning headaches. We see a lot of high school kids with morning headaches. And one of the reasons of morning headaches is if you're, if you're not breathing all night long, or even as an adult, if you're not breathing all night long, you wake up with a carbon dioxide headache. You've built up too much carbon dioxide, and you have to blow it off. And once you get it off, then the headache goes away. 
Middle-aged people, pauses in breathing, snoring, excessive daytime sleepiness. If you have a BMI greater than 30, really, but even 35, the chances that you have sleep apnea go way up. For men, if your neck size is greater than 17, or women, neck size 16, your chances of sleep apnea go up considerably. Now, we find, we're finding out that over the age of 60, the two biggest problems uh, that, that correlate with sleep apnea is not feeling well rested and having to go to the bathroom three or more times a night. If you live beyond page, age 60, there's some type of protective mechanisms where the pauses in breathing and snoring don't affect you like they, they do if you start this way in, your middle age, in the middle age uh, category. So how can we determine someone's excessively sleepy? There's a lot of uh, scales out there to determine if someone's excessively sleepy. I mean, sometimes the history will tell you. I have one patient who told me he fell asleep uh, in front of a speaker at a rock concert. I said, you're excessively sleepy. That's, you don't have to take any more tests. Uh, but there are these tests, you can get them online, and basically it's the Epworth sleepiness scale so that you say, if you're sitting and reading, what are the chances of falling asleep? If you're watching TV, what are the chances of falling asleep? If you're sitting in a public place, are, you know, do, you, do you go with your partner every time you go to the movies? Is he or she out like a light, just sleeping all the time? Um, uh, lying down in the afternoon, if you're talking with someone, I mean, there are people that fall asleep in my office. I'm talking to them and it's like, wake up, you know, it's, uh, they're sleepy. Uh, without alcohol, you fall asleep or you're in a car, you stop for a few minutes in traffic. Um, I have one patient that his boss dismissed him uh, because he kept falling asleep as he was running the front loader. Uh, and he didn't want him to, to crash into someone. And he, he wouldn't come in for several months. I don't know what he was afraid of, but he finally came in when he fell asleep, ran into a police car, they took him downtown, and he decided it's time. So a lot of us men are stubborn, you know? I mean, it's just, I don't know why, but we, we are. Um, so he finally came in. So if you score zero to nine, you're either in the normal range or mild. Moderate is, is 10 to 15, and then 16 to 24, you're severely sleepy. Okay, what other condition, this is for, I don't know who asked for the narcolepsy slides, but I'll just show them briefly what narcolepsy is. First of all, with obstructive sleep apnea, if you treat it, the vast majority of time, the sleepiness goes away. The most common cause of sleepiness is people just don't sleep enough. I mean, how many of us have learned to function on six hours of sleep a night? I mean, probably quite a few of us, or five hours. Uh, in high school, you know, the neurologists always send us uh, uh, kids to evaluate, but it's a, it's a tip-off when they only sleep six hours a night in high school. That's, and that's really why most people are sleepy. But in narcolepsy, you're excessively sleepy. If you have sleep apnea, the symptoms improve. Pretty much the peak ages of narcolepsy at, at diagnosis are age 15 to age 35. It used to take about 15 years to really diagnose a narcoleptic because someone would come in with these vague symptoms. We didn't understand narcolepsy. We'd send them to neurology. Neurology would say, you must, must be something wrong with your head. They'd send you to psychiatry. Psychiatry would fill them with drugs. And it would take about 15 years on average. We're a lot better than that today. Uh, symptoms as you're excessively sleepy. People have sleep paralysis, which means when they wake up, they're paralyzed. I call this the sleeping beauty syndrome. Because remember Sleeping Beauty, she was essentially paralyzed, and what woke her up? A kiss, yes, yes. And that's what'll wake up someone with sleep paralysis. You just touch them, if you really like them, you can kiss them, and they just wake right up. So, Sleeping Beauty syndrome. Hypnagogic hallucinations, that means when they're going to sleep, um, they begin to have hallucinations. They're not crazy, they just begin to hallucinate. Um, and cataplexy, you say, what is cataplexy? Cataplexy, let me back up. When you dream, you are paralyzed. Otherwise, we'd all act out our dreams. But there's a definite system in place that when you dream, you're paralyzed. So that paralysis of the dream state comes out in a narcoleptic, and they can become paralyzed.
See, his mistake is he's smiling. That is cataplexy. Some people learn to live with it their whole life. Occasionally, you'll run into someone and you think they're mad at you because they come in with this face that goes. And it isn't that they're mad at you. It's they've learned to live with cataplexy because the thing that stimulates this cataplectic attack the most is laughter. So tell an narcoleptic a joke and <laughs> down they go. One of my patients is now an 85-year-old priest. He came in because he, he's learned his whole life to, you know, I don't know what kind of sermons he gave all these years, but, you know, he's the nicest man. Uh, but he was at the casino, and a couple of his parishioners were there. And one of the parishioners told him a joke, and the guy just fell right over on his wife. And he just said, I, I can't, I don't know what to do about this. He came in, he's got cataplexy, he's fixed, he's doing great, he's still... Uh, back, uh, uh, he's retired, but he's, he's back into, into giving sermons and telling jokes for the first time in his life, which is pretty good. Okay, so that's narcolepsy with cataplexy. Emotional stimuli uh, causes it. When people go out, they retain consciousness. They know what's going on. Their brains are with it. They may be down on the floor like that little kid, but he knows exactly what's going on. And Usually the reflexes are absent. If I have a malingerer in the office and, and they are just like living up the cataplexy, like it's almost like watching a theatrical performance, I let them do the cataplexy thing and then I hit them in the knee with the hammer. Several times. Um, not because I want to be mean or anything. But, but if they have real cataplexy, the reflexes are gone. So they put this little girl in front of a TV and got her to laugh a little bit. people with narcolepsy, with cataplexy, and they just have those drops. And then the final slide on narcolepsy is, again, excessive daytime sleepiness is a, is a component. Oftentimes, it's idiopathic. We don't know what's causing it. We did discover the last couple decades, there's a place in the brain that secretes something called hypocretin, and people that have narcolepsy with cataplexy have very low levels of, of hypocretin. Hypocretin is a substance in the brain that keeps you awake. So if we if you lose that substance, you're going to be sleepy all the time. Sometimes brain injury can cause um, narcolepsy. If you damage the pathways that regulate sleep and wake, uh, and damage the pathways that regulate atonia, or basically that muscle paralysis when you're sleeping, you can develop narcolepsy. So, uh, about 90% of people will have this gene. Uh, we saw with the, in Europe when they gave this certain vaccine which, uh, which had an adjuvant in it, which we don't use, we saw a tenfold increase in narcolepsy. And we don't quite fully understand the, the process. We diagnose it. We give these people a chance to fall asleep with something called a mean sleep latency test. Basically, it's a, several chances to fall asleep. Narcoleptics not only fall asleep, but on average, they go into rapid eye move, movement sleep within three minutes. Normally, you go into rapid eye movement sleep a, about an hour after you fall asleep. The treatments, uh, sometimes you can treat narcolepsy with antidepressants. Antidepressants shut off rapid eye movement sleep. And so these people's brain don't see the paralysis of sleep. And for a lot of narcoleptics, that really helps them, shutting that off. Um, there's a drug out called sodium oxabate, which works beautifully. There's a new drug, relatively new, called modafinil. We don't quite understand how it works, but it seems to stimulate dopamine in the brain and keeps people awake. And then daytime stimulants is what used to be used for many years, and then frequent daytime naps. And so there's narcolepsy with excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, let's get back to the other area. Snoring is very, very common in children, 10%. And we know that by the time you're age 60, 
about 60% of men, or basically half of us snore pretty good by the time we're age 60, and we keep snoring. Now, of people who snore, about 30% have obstructive sleep apnea. So there's a lot of us that snore that do not have obstructive sleep apnea. But this fellow just says, I don't have obstructive sleep apnea. guy. Okay, so he is snoring real loud. He's, he's, then he stops breathing again for 10, 20, 30 seconds. But he's a loud snorer. He doesn't believe he has obstructive sleep apnea, but he definitely does have obstructive sleep apnea. So 30% of chronic loud snorers have obstructive sleep apnea. What about as you get a little older? By the time you're age 60 to 85, about 20 to 25 percent of us have obstructive sleep apnea that really should be treated. About 20 to 25 percent of us. Also in the elderly, what's one of the most common symptoms? We mentioned earlier having to go to the bathroom all the time. And we think the mechanism that was proposed by Gopal was that intrathoracic pressure when you're breathing in against a closed airway it increases the pressure in your chest, and the heart seems to think that you're fluid overloaded. It secretes this enzyme or this uh, uh, molecule that says it's time to pee out the extra fluid. And I have countless men, I don't know why it affects men more than women, but I have countless men that one of their biggest complaints is they frequently wet the bed. And it's embarrassing as can be to these men um, at all ages, but they frequently wet the bed and they don't know what to do with it. No one's ever approached them. They never wanted to talk about it. And once we fix their sleep apnea for a large percentage of them, having to wet the bed just goes away. And they are very delighted with that. This is a recent study. I, I never knew this word. There's people that are called nocturics. But that's what they're calling them these days. If you have to go to the bathroom two or more times at night and you urinate over 2.5 liters per day, you have a much higher chance of having sleep apnea that needs to be treated. In this particular study, where they take 75 controls and 75 people who have to urinate at least twice a night, uh, the amount of obstructive sleep apnea, the AHI was 15 to 20. Or in other words, they had moderate uh, sleep apnea. And in the male group, it was also increased with an AHI uh, greater than 40 uh, for people that have to urinate all the time. So it can be a big symptom. And what's happening with the elderly as you and I get older, uh, you're waking up all the time, you're desaturating all the time. Again, unrefreshed sleep and having to go to the bathroom frequently can be definite symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. So how do we diagnose this? We diagnose it by doing something called a polysomnogram. And you'll see a few of these tonight. We look at the brain to see what's happening there. We monitor air coming in and out of the nose and mouth, belts on the chest. Usually you have a, a lead on the leg to pick up movement. Look at the oxygen. Oftentimes we're looking at the carbon dioxide. And we're also filming people because it's good to see if someone has a really unique disorder that you have it on camera. And so this is a polysomnogram. And I'll, the easy way to think about it, the top two lines are the eyes. This is the brain. This is the chin, in case you have a lot of movement in your chin. This is the heart rate. We can tell when people are snoring. This is the breathing pattern here. The oxygen level. And then the carbon dioxide. So that's kind of a simple schematic. So when you have obstructive sleep apnea, and we look at these things, again, we look at the eyes, the brain. But here in the breathing parameters, people have these pauses in breathing. Down goes the oxygen. Pauses in breathing. Down goes the oxygen. So that's the general premises, premise of diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea. So what happens? You develop a vicious cycle with obstructive sleep apnea. You have an apneic event. 
your oxygen drops, you have sympathetic activation, that means your heart rate may go up, your blood pressure may go up, the brain wakes up, and you finally breathe again. And so this is the continuous cycle of obstructive sleep apnea. So why is that bad? Let's take a look. This guy is dreaming. He shouldn't be moving at all. I'm hoping to breathe sometime soon as well as you are. Okay, he never wakes up. He thrashes, throws the covers off. His partner says, I can't believe how many times I've been hit because he's thrashing about and kicked and he never wakes up. So what's actually going on? When we look at his sleep study, first of all, he's got these terrible pauses in breathing, but look at the heart rate. 100, within seconds he drops to 60, within seconds he goes to 120, within seconds he goes to 60, back up to 120. This is uh, uh, 30 seconds, by the way. Try doing that awake. What do you think that does to your, to your brain and your heart and your kidneys when you are sleeping? It's amazing to just, it's like giving someone a dose of adrenaline and then giving them something else just to shut them down every five to 10 seconds. So he's doing this all night long. And if you have severe obstructive sleep apnea, you may be doing a version of this all night long. It's amazing. So this is called a sympathetic surge. That there's sympathetics in your body are going up and down and up and down. And what happens is people that have severe obstructive sleep apnea, oftentimes they die of sudden cardiac death between 12 and 6 in the morning. That's because their heart's going up and down and up and down. And so is their blood pressure. Whereas normally people, when we have a heart attacks, it's usually in the early hours of the morning. So we know that sleep apnea is associated with twice the risk of stroke or all-cause mortality four times the amount of hypertension, and if your AHI, the number of times you stop breathing, is greater than 36, then you have a threefold increase of all-cause mortality. So you can see with all this sympathetic surge why people have more heart problems, more problems with the blood pressure, uh, problems with insulin resistance, because when this is going on all night long, the levels of, of glucose never seem to go down in your body, and you're always having much elevated levels of glucose, and these people become very difficult diabetics to treat. Very difficult. What happens with hypoxemia? We're understanding now that people who have a significant amount of hypoxemia, we believe it accelerates Alzheimer's disease. I mean, this gentleman is a setup living from 90 to 70 to 60 to 40 percent oxygen all night long, you should be 88 percent and above. I'll just briefly mention these, that this is in your paper, uh, but these are the mechanism of untreated sleep apnea. Do you think there's a lot of inflammatory components that are working through your body that never shut down? The hypoxia is never good. Uh, we think there's reactive oxygen species that are damaging your endothelial cells. And these, in turn, form adhesion molecules that may be creating more plaques um, in, in your heart vessels. Uh, the sympathetic activity, and this is the paper that's in the back of your, uh, your handout, says that some, they've measured blood pressures that go up to 240 um, at the termination of an apneic event. That's a stroke level. 
And of course, we know that uh, sleep disordered breathing has two to four times the odds of atrial fibrillation compared with people who have treated sleep apnea or no treated sleep apnea. Okay, that's some of the mechanisms. People are always worried, am I going to die tonight? You're not going to die tonight. Because the brain has a mechanism that says, wake up. You don't realize you're waking up, but you may be waking up 20 times an hour. And that's exactly what's happening here. This person is obstructing, oxygen drops to 50%, and the brain wakes up. Then he obstructs again, oxygen drops to in the 40s, and the brain wakes up. That's why people don't die of sleep apnea. You have an internal mechanism that says it's time to wake up. However, if you let this go on for years and years and years, then all those other factors begin to add up, and then you get the cardiovascular problems and the cerebral problems and the strokes. So why is it that people die from sleep apnea? Occasionally, uh, I think I was still living in Wisconsin when I heard that Reggie White died from sleep apnea, the, the football player. Well, what happens is if you have severe sleep apnea and your brain is used to, let's say, dropping to 70% oxygen and then waking up, but if you give someone alcohol, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, methadone's probably the worst, and you suppress the brain's ability to wake up, then it doesn't wake up and it acutely drops another 5, 10, 15% in oxygen, and that's what kills people. If you slowly get there, your brain gets used to 70, but if you just drop it, it from you know, one night to the next and don't allow the arousal, that's exactly what kills people. So <clears throat> this is scissors, represents the alcohol, the medications, uh, benzodiazepines. You block this arousal, down you go. OK, let's quickly go on to children because some of you have children with sleep apnea. About one to three, one to four percent of kids have obstructive sleep apnea. Why is that important? As we mentioned earlier, kids self-stimulate. They don't sleep enough hours. You begin to see a decreased productivity in school. They get hyperactive, uh, poor grades, uh, accidents, and it's all because they're not sleeping well. And there's a lot of symptoms that are there in your page that we won't go into, but you know, snoring, pauses in breathing, choking noises, all that's related with kids having obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the biggest cause of obstructive sleep apnea in, in the pediatric population are huge tonsils. And you get about a 75 to 85 percent cure rate if you take the tonsils out. But not every child with huge tonsils has obstructive sleep apnea. Um, usually peaks between ages two and eight hyperactivity, enuresis. Uh, this is a physician's kid. This is a friend of mine who, uh, we as physicians sometimes can look in our backyard and not see what's going on. I, but this is a, a, a one of my friend's children that I studied. is uh, my friend said, you mean he's got a sucks of sleep apnea? Well, you should have seen him at Christmas. This is good. So sometimes we don't realize what's in our own backyard. But uh, when I look at his study, this is his hypnogram. And this poor little guy is going from 92, dropping into the 70s, back to 90, drop to 80. But this is the way he's been living, well, most of his little life which isn't good for his brain. And when I do, again, on a bigger picture, he's waking up, this line up here is waking up. He only has a few cycles of REM. Little people, the littler you are, the more the brain likes rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, lots of desaturations, and so that's his profile. Okay, so what are some symptoms you find in kids? Uh, sometimes I'll ask a kid to keep his mouth shut, 
not just because he's talking too much, but I want to see can he breathe through his nose. If you can't close your mouth and breathe through your nose, there's a good chance that there's a big obstruction back there called the adenoids, and you're not clearing air well. Nasal speech, um, mandibular retronathia, that means the chin is way back. If the chin is back, so is the tongue. So people who have small chins have, or chins that are seen back have a higher incidence of sleep apnea. A special group that we treat are kids with Down syndrome. Uh, because of the way their face is, their huge tongue, they have a much higher incidence of sleep apnea. Uh, there's a large amount of them that have uh, thyroid disease, and that always should be checked. But it's about 40% in the Down's children. How do we treat it? If it's mild, sometimes kids will respond to nasal steroids uh, and something called Singulair. If it's moderate, again, the tonsil removal and the adenoids works well. What if you just want to get a quick fix to see does he have severe sleep apnea or not? Well, you get something called an oximeter, which we've been looking at all night. And the amazing thing about this oximetry, do you see the black where this is REM and down it drops? I call it the beard sign. And the reason for that is when you go into rapid eye movement sleep, you have paralysis, you lose the use of your accessory muscles, and your oxygen has a greater tendency to fall right down. And so this doesn't say you don't have sleep apnea, but sometimes if you're in a rural community, uh, I don't consider Los Alamos rural. Where I was in Wisconsin was rural. Um, I mean, people really did pay me with donuts and stuff. And it wasn't too bad either. Uh, the staff really liked the cakes coming in. Um, but if you um, just need to say, are they really bad? This guy's really bad. OK, so what are some ways to treat it real quick? Uh, dentists have used mandibular devices, and what a mandibular device does is they, there's various forms, and dentists are incredibly well trained at this, those who do it. It just moves the back of your jaw forward, moves the tongue away from your throat, and then you can breathe at night. So mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea usually responds quite well if people just don't like CPAP. But this, for whatever you like, is not too bad. What about the people that complain about CPAP? Well, you need to realize how we treated CPAP before 1980, or how we treated sleep apnea before 1980. Does anyone remember? What's that? Oh, absolutely. You, get a, you got a trach. That means they cut a hole here, put a little, you know, maybe that's why turtlenecks were popular when many of us were younger. I don't know. But you get, they got a trach, and they put a, a, a hole there, and then they could breathe fine. So before 1980, uh, tra a tracheostomy was the way to go. And then about 1980, he published his paper in 81, and so he got one of his fellows to get the vacuum cleaner out of the closet, reverse the polarity of the motor so that it blew air out instead of in, and the, he got these poor dogs. You know, you always get a dog, unfortunately. And he glued this mask to the dog's face, and uh, one story says the dog was so happy the next day, it, 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 it danced and dug up all the bones, and, and the tech said it even gave him two paws up. I don't know if I believe that story. I'm just telling you, that's, that's what I read. Um, but from there, the, the next patient that came in was a construction worker, and he said, you have to have a tracheostomy. And the guy says, forget it. And so he thought, here's my chance to test this out. So he got the vacuum cleaner back out, put a mask on the guy's face, and it was amazing. He slept well, he did well, and so the very first CPAP machine, basically, we can thank, uh, I don't know if it was a Hoover or what, we can thank that company for that. Because what literally happens, here's the obstruction, give them on CPAP or a mandibular device, and all of a sudden it pushes that tongue out of the way and people can breathe just fine. Here's before CPAP treatment. This is the same patient, by the way. Obstructive sleep apnea. Look at even the brain. It just, even, you don't have to be a neurologist to say just something doesn't look quite right. And then after CPAP, the brain is just looking nice and happy. Rapid eye movement, sleep, regular respirations. His oxygen now is in the 90% as opposed to 40%. So this is a happy camper. All in one night, he got this difference. His oxygen went from doing all this to beautifully above 88%. I just had to t tell you how happy are people that are treated with CPAP. Mike, uh, 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 listen, guess what today is? 
it's hump day. Woo woo! Ronnie, how happy are folks who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico? I'd say happier than a camel on Wednesday. The only difference is if you have sleep app and your sleep app is treated, you'll be happier than a camel on Wednesday. Okay, so again, CPAP isn't that bad of a deal. When kids come into the lab and they bring their bear, we literally do CPAP their bear also. Bears do great, I'm telling you. They feel good the next morning. It's not a problem, but we, we just both CPAP on the bear. Uh, kids do quite well with CPAP, and many children do need it. Um, they do work at it, but kids do incredibly well. And there's, there's a little bear with the CPAP on him, so that works out fine. And so, what questions do you have? I'll take a few minutes for questions, and then, because um, I don't want any of you to go into, into a coma, uh, you can leave and I'll just hang out and you can ask me as many more questions as you like, or how do you do the question thing here? Well, we just want to thank you so much. Oh. That was awesome. That was really oh, very awesome. kind. I, and, I, I put uh, my, my phone number and email there if, if you just need. Uh... And, and all of these slides are in your handout. And then within about two weeks, PAC 8 will have it on our website. So you can review Dr. Rell's uh, talk. And uh, I'd like to uh, open it up for questions now. And we can use the microphone, or you can hand uh, written questions uh, to the center. But, do I have any questions that I can give the microphone to? Okay. So, Dr. Rawls, if you go to the sleep center and they diagnose you and they give you a CPAP, uh, BiPAP machine or whatever, and you use it, and you, you don't really feel that much different in the morning. Is it working or not? Or how do you know it's working? Or you still fall asleep when the preacher is giving his sermon? Well, my experience with a CPAP has been uh, not what you have talked about here. Um, basically, I think my problem has been with the Dura medical uh, providers uh, and non-support and uh, trying to get a mask that fits. Uh, it doesn't work very well. And these people seem to be more interested in the money than they are in the patient. And the other half of my question is, uh, why is it that we have to uh, come to the sleep center twice in order to get the uh, this machine set up right? Why don't we just do it once? That's an excellent question. Both of them are, are good. One, they're called PME companies or durable medical equipment companies, you know, whatever other names they have. It's basically, that's what they are. And, and you need to find one that just serves you well. If you're one of these people that stays up all night long, you only fall 
at the last two hours of the night, it's hard to tell. Uh, if you're really motivated, and some people are very motivated, they come in and say, I know I have sleep apnea, I don't want to be treated for this. We do it all one night. Because all you need is a two hour diagnostic period. But if there's other reasons that, I, you know, the person either doesn't think they have sleep apnea, or some people are just nervous. They go, I don't know if I can sleep with all these wires, or they're anxious. Um, and so, yeah, I say, well, just do it two nights. But if you're motivated, do it one night. You're absolutely correct. It should be done in one night. Um, for me, if, if, if I feel a patient's motivated, the answer is absolutely yes, two nights. But I think there are other factors. Or if I'm looking for a different sleep disorder. And this is something some of you have seen but maybe not have recognized. For example, my Parkinson's patients, uh, probably half of them have lost the paralysis of REM. And they develop a condition called rapid eye movement uh, disorder, rap or behavior, red behavior disorder. And these people act out their dreams. And so there I'm not looking for sleep apnea. I'm looking to see what's going on and what are they doing in the middle of the night. Uh, but a lot of my Parkinson's patients have, will have movements where they can barely even move during the day. And one of uh, the wives told me her husband had a television set over her head and was ready to drop it on her. Uh, but these people have very interesting movements. Uh, so it depends on what we're looking for. If it's straight obstructive sleep apnea, you're absolutely correct. One night testing. Uh, if we're looking for something else, seizure disorders, for example. 10% of all seizures happen only when you're sleeping. So if I'm looking for a seizure disorder, then I want a whole night. And then if I discover that they have sleep apnea, then that's a different thing. But when there is a seizure disorder present, particularly in children, but it also happens in adults, then we're looking for much more than sleep apnea. I hope that that's helpful. And I'd like to add that uh, since Dr. Rawls has been at the Los Alamos Medical Center the last four months, uh, I think uh, we're seeing a lot more patient satisfaction. So thank you for that. We had a question back here. Can you have nocturnal hypoxia or low, low oxygen saturation and not have obstructive sleep apnea? And, and how would you distinguish that? Oh, you're absolutely correct. You can have nocturnal hypoxia or low oxygen levels and there's absolutely zero sleep apnea. It could be other conditions. It may be the heart, maybe the lungs. Uh, sometimes if you're incredibly overweight, um, you know, sometimes the, the stomach is pushing up on the diaphragm, and so there are other reasons to have hypoxemia. And if we do a, an all-night sleep study, and someone doesn't have sleep apnea, they shouldn't be treated with sleep apnea. And all they have is hypoxemia, they should just be treated with oxygen. You were talking about the durable medical equipment. Now, most of these, um, they put you into a five-year, they lock you in for five years, but in five years, lots of medical advances take place. So you get stuck with a machine that's three or four years old. How do you suggest you get a new one as the, the market progresses or as the equipment? It's the durable medical company locks you in. It's they the insurance? insurance in. Okay. And this is why I'm hesitant. Um, and this is an excellent question because this gentleman brought up. I'm hesitant sometimes to give someone uh, a CPAP machine if their sleep study just doesn't fit right. I mean, it's like a pair of shoes. If I look at that study, I said, this something doesn't fit right. Because once I prescribe that CPAP, and, and, you, and the person has a terrible time with it, and they need a bypass, which is a different kind of machine, insurance does, doesn't cover it. They say, we're sorry, we already gave you one. You gotta wait five years now. And so I run into that. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant if things aren't looking like I want them to look. Um, and, and I've read thousands of studies, you know, so, so for me, it's like whatever all of us do, when you do something thousands of times, you expect it to fall within a certain parameter. So that is, is more often, um, and that's what I do do, and sometimes I think it might work, but I'm not sure. I give people what's called a two to four week auto trial. That means you put them on an auto CPAP for two to four weeks, and typically the DME companies pay for that, and then if it's a good fit, you know. If it's a bad fit, we have a waste of so there are things that we try to do to avoid exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Um, my question is, if you fall asleep on your back, 
your the muscles in your jaw will relax, and I guess your airway will be obstructed. So why doesn't everybody snore? And by the same token, why don't you just lie on your side, and will that open the, the airway? You're, you're absolutely correct. Now, it depends on, you know, they're all different. I mean, if, if the tongue, you lay down, the tongue covers the whole airway enough to cause the saturation, it's one thing, but sometimes it just covers part way, and people do just fine. Uh, so it kind of depends on the anatomy. And there are some individuals who, every time they're on their side, they have zero sleep apnea. And if they're on their back, they have terrible sleep apnea. And so for those people, they call it positional training. If you just keep them from sleeping on their back, they do just fine. Uh, and there's different ways to do that. You can buy these expensive t-shirts that have got tennis balls in them, and pull your back, you're so uncomfortable. Uh, uh, one patient puts on one of those, uh, Bag that you carry books in, and he's all, he never goes on the side. I have one woman that uses a hairpin, and she says every time she rolls on her back, it stabs her head, and she pulls on the side. I don't recommend that if you tell you what people do, but you are absolutely correct. If you do perfect on your side, you don't want to use the CPAP, the, the, the goal is just sleep on your side. Yes, ma'am. I've been told that uh, obstructive sleep apnea can raise your waking blood glucose levels. Uh, what's the physiology behind this, and will this affect uh, increase with age? Well, we showed you that video of that guy with his heart rate went way up and down. Well, what's happening is the cortisol is being stimulated all night long. Normally at night, your cortisol drops, and as the cortisol drops, then your blood glucose drops. In the morning, when you're waking up, cortisol begins to increase, blood glucose increases, that's normal. But with sleep apnea, you got that cortisol being shoved all night long saying, breathe, 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 and you got the glucose, you know, just being up there all the time, and that's why you have abnormally elevated glucose levels and difficult to, to control diabetics. Does yes, that get worse with age? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I would, you know, I, I think it's just gonna be bad. I don't know about worse, I think it's just going to be bad having it up there all the time. And the poor control year after year after year, that catches up with you in other areas. So we have to bring it to what's normal. Yes, sir. How accurate are, are the uh, new home sleep studies? The home sleep studies? They are, they can tell you if you have sleep apnea or not. Uh, I've had some home sleep studies that will show an AHI of 5, and I'll, I'll repeat the study in the lab, and I've got an AHI of 80. So there can be a huge discrepancy. Uh, they're getting better, but they can at least tell someone, you do have sleep apnea. Um, for the majority of times, if you do have sleep apnea, you should get that treated. So it's kind of a good screening tool. But if someone has terrible symptoms, um, and they have a normal home sleep study, you know, I, I, I believe the individual over the, over the sleep study. This gentleman has yes, a last question or comment. Well, I have a question, and then, if you permit, I would like to make a comment. 
Uh, the question is, uh, have the medical people uh, noticed any connection between uh, sleep apnea and food allergies? Well, okay, the reason I came here tonight is to make a comment on that. It's not scientific evidence because it's only a personal anecdote, uh, if you'll give me a few minutes. I uh, have not, I myself have not had any uh, sleep apnea or uh, wild snoring for about eight years. But starting from high school, I was awful. And my wife used to call me a, wolf, a wounded buffalo. Uh, and then something happened, which changed the situation. Uh, I was talking with my son, who happens to be a physician, and he recommended a diet. Uh, at the time, we had no uh, thought of sleep apnea in mind. The diet was uh, because I had marginally high blood pressure, um, uh, somewhat high cholesterol, and was overweight, about 10 or 15 pounds, something like that. My wife was also uh, about 10 or 15 pounds. So he recommended this uh, paleo diet, which has, uh, has some neuro no notoriety around. Briefly speaking, uh, the paleo diet says that you eat only fish and lean meat and, and vegetables and fruit, no, no grain, no dairy, and no sweets. Very dull. Uh, so we did this, both of us, for, uh, assiduously for a certain amount of time, a couple of years. Uh, it worked fine. My cholesterol and, and uh, blood pressure went way down. Both of us lost weight. We got to what was more or less uh, normal weight. Uh, but then there was a bonus. One night, my, my, my wife says, you're not, ha you're not having any sleep apnea or snoring anymore. And it really went away. Now, in subsequent years, uh, we don't adhere to the diet too carefully, because as I said, it's an awfully boring diet. Uh, and once in a while, we splurge. For example, there was one night we went out with our family to a, a nice restaurant, had a big meal, every uh, course of which happened to have cheese. And that night, I was snoring again, very loud. And there have been other incidents of like that where I have a slight amount of snoring because I've slightly deviated from the diet. So that's what I, that was my comment. Thank you very much. And I'm going to, and I'm going to go ahead and draw our wonderful session to a close. Uh, if uh, someone uh, lost some keys, we found a set of keys. Uh, Joe Zoen has them in the back. If uh, you're missing, they look like car keys. Uh, if you like these programs, uh, please help support financially the uh, Heart Council so that we can continue putting on these type of programs. And Dr. Rouse has offered to stay for 10 or 15 more minutes and answer any of your questions. So please come up. And again, thank you so much. Thank you.